week on Money and Me, I'm joined by possibly Britain's best-known financial pundit and also the founder of one of our most successful investment management companies, Justin Urquhart Stewart. Justin, welcome to Money and Me. Thank you very much. Please be here. Now, obviously today you're known as a, as a fine, upstanding figure in the financial community, but uh, at the risk of shocking the British public, I have to say that back in the playground, when you were seven years old, you were a bit of a dealer, aren't you? How <laughs> to get yourself into serious trouble. My first efforts at actually trying to make some money and getting thoroughly punished for it. I get, in those days, Mars bars were really expensive. Mm. They're a tradable item. And uh, what I'd worked out was if I got my father's razor blade, and of course those days there were terrible sort of big blades used to, and I chopped it up into seven pieces, mm -hmm. I could sell off six pieces, uh, make some profit, and then buy another Mars bar and got the last bit for myself. And that was fine. Mm -hmm. And then the teacher stopped me and I got hauled off and got thoroughly whacked for it, not for actually carrying out uh, early forms of capitalism, but for having a dangerous instrument in the form of razor blades. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Well, obviously, a very, very dangerous background. But, of course, you, know, you, you were brought up in a, a kind of a military family, I think. Mm. What, what was that environment like? And was the subject of money ever brought up in the family? Uh, money was never, ever talked about, in the slightest, mainly because mm. they hadn't got a clue about it. Um, I'm the odd one out. All of them have joined the army for generations back. Um, and uh, so I actually said to my mother, you know, sort of saying, you know, she was always rather keen, and sort of saying, what are you going to do with your life? And um, it was all a bit confusing because she had went through three husbands, one of whom purported to be my father, but the details hazy. <laughs> okay. And um, I said, well, actually, I want to have my own business. And she looked down a rather long nose at me and said, oh, my God, you want to go into trade. Do you realise we have a separate door for that? <laughs> and that, was, in many ways, summed up the British attitudes in mm. those days. Mm. We weren't entrepreneurial. You either worked for the state or you worked for the services and the government, or you were a professional mm. or you worked for a large corporation. Did you have your own business? No, of course you didn't. But so the idea of actually having your own business and doing that was so regarded. You somehow go, go get a proper job. And I, eventually I was sort of told off, go and be a lawyer, which was just dreadful. Indeed. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, we have one thing in common. Although I studied law at university. I had the decency to drop out. You actually completed the course and trained as a barrister. So how, how did you avoid this fate worse than death of being a lawyer? Realising that well, actually being a barrister was incredibly dull. Um, I asked him, well, my pupil master, who trains you as you're doing these sort of things, said, Justin, do you realise there's more in money in crime than defending it? So at that moment, I thought, financial services, now there's a crime. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, you could do something which is actually, you could earn some money, but also you could actually make a bit of a difference. Mm. As a barrister, you were at the end of the line. I had to make sure you had a bad problem. The worse your problem, the happier I'd be. Mm. That's not a good place to be in. No. What you want to do is actually create something, build something, do something which makes a difference. But I think you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves here because um, despite your early attempt at entrepreneurship, when you actually got to university to study law, you did actually start to get into some trouble with debt, I believe. Yes, I was useless. Absolutely yeah. useless. So building up debt with the joy of a credit card, what was that for? Well, it was just money to spend. Until you realise you actually spent the limit and now, now actually can't pay it down. Um, no knowledge at all. And I was a spoiled brat. I have given, I have lots of extra, extra cash and things like that. But it wasn't in a bad position. Of course, in those days, you didn't have student debt. I managed to achieve that on my own. I didn't need the government to give me debt. Um, <laughs> but it was, no, it was uh, frankly pathetic. And this yeah. really does reflect what's happened in Britain. We don't teach people financial and management, how to look after themselves. We teach people economics, like we need another economist. Exactly. So, so how, how did you overcome this debt that you left university It with? just took a very long time just to try and sort it all out and realise, yeah. actually, of course, once you get yourself into it, this is dumb, this is stupid. Mm. How do you actually dig yourself out of it? And you just have to learn it by, by pain and re realising, actually, I've got, you go out and work. Yeah. And I ended up on Southampton Docks. Uh, I was uh, it's quite funny. I think I'm the only shop steward in the London Stock Exchange. Shop steward, yes. you? Uh, for Union of Construction and Allied Technical Trades. I was not called Justin, because that wouldn't go down terribly well. Not Arcot Stewart. I was, I'm, I'm actually a member of, known as John Stewart. Okay. And I was shop steward for UCAT on Southampton Docks. A proud boast. <laughs> well, I, I got very well paid for it. Helped pay off the, uh, the credit card debt. Excellent. So that was good. Excellent. So, so, so you, you, you decide that being a barrister is not for you. How do you make this leap into financial services? Was there some kind of road to Damascus moment? Well, it was actually more desperation and what can you do? And one of the things I did actually would like to get involved in was actually trade, actually understanding trade, how trade mm. widgets go from one place to another and around the world. Mm. And of course, in a military world, of course, that again is how things get passed around the world. So I joined an old fashioned British trading bank, mm. Barclays DCO, Dominion Colonial and Overseas. 
you virtually had a sort of you know, white hat to go with the thing. Right. And I remember when they said, you know, we're going to send you off uh, for some proper training. And I said, that's jolly good. And he said, we're going to send you off first of all. And they had this huge book of all the places in the world where Barclays DCO existed. And mm. it went from Anguilla right the way through to, you know, to Zambia. And it, when this, I remember this director going through the entire list of countries. And I thought, this is getting worse and worse and worse. Till eventually we got to the end of the, virtually the end of it, I thought, well, I'm going to end up going to Zaire. Mm. And he said, Uganda. We need more people in Uganda. I said, but there's a war on there. Exactly. We need more. Excellent. As a start. Hospital pass. <laughs> so how was life in Uganda in Barclays Bank? Mm, a li somewhat limited. <laughs> <laughs> on the basis, I had a slight technical hitch. There was a coup after a few months, and I found myself in hospital. But anyway, that was all fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. But it taught you about actually proper trade finance. How do you get goods going exported from Britain, from mm -hmm. elsewhere around the world, mm -hmm. properly financed, constructed, and actually then making sure that they're properly embedded in that country, and vice versa as well. Good old-fashioned trading. And that was the bit that I learned there. So, Justin, after uh, your entry into the, the banking world, it wasn't that long before you got involved in one of the biggest changes in our stock market's history, the Big Bang. Yeah. Well, I came back because so I'd been working out in Singapore. Um, and then from there, Big Bang was, well, we had Baby Bang, the build-up and development of it. And this was going to be the real reorganisation of the city because the city was an old-fashioned cartel uh, mm. of how things used to work, not very efficiently. They tend to rewrite history. But this was going to inject huge amounts of mostly American money coming into the old world of broking. Mm -hmm. So it came back, helped with that. As part of Barclays, they built something called BZW, which is Barclays Dzut Wed. Mm -hmm. And basically, they got Dzut and Bevan and a broking firm, Wed Durlacher, a market making jobbing firm, mm -hmm. and welded it, welded it together with Barclays Merchant Bank, which no one had heard of, uh, even in Barclays. And created, therefore, this coordinated group which was going to be able to provide services to everybody. And of course, it turned out to be a complete mess. Oh dear. Um, but it was a lovely concept, but yeah. no one had really thought it through, and millions was wasted on this. But it allowed me to understand you know, actually how the broking operations, the underlying systems were working badly. Mm. And from that, we set up a business called Broker Services, uh, which white labeled a lot of other stockbrokers, people like Salomons and Nikkei and things like that, to operate in the city. Um, and we could actually do the trading for them and the settlement for them. Mm. And that grew into actually ended up being UK's largest stockbroker. And is that when you started doing your market updates that became this, this, this glittering media <laughs> career? <laughs> it just so happened that BZW was being reorganized by Barclays again. And they had a camera on their trading floor. And uh, so I got my messenger and gave him a letter of authority to go in there. And I said, look, if there's any chance of actually getting the camera up, let me know. If anyone challenges you, just keep quiet. He phones up an hour later and he said, Justin, I've got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, it's stuck to the wall. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Forget it. Don't worry about it. He said, no, no, I'm just I'm going to be a bit longer. I said, no, Peter, don't leave it. An hour later, he turns up with a wall. <laughs> with a camera attached to it. <laughs> so therefore, we ended up with this camera, and BT moved at speed. So about six months later, we got it working. And we phoned up Bloomberg, who were just starting Bloomberg Television, all those sort of things, and said, do you want a market report? And off it went from there. Wow. And did, did you have the, uh, the, the red accoutrements from day one, or is that something that just kind of came in a bit later? I was mostly red, because my father had red braces and things like that, but I had yeah. other ones as well. But the red seemed to stick, so therefore it was a bit corny. But uh, now I'm sort of stuck with them. Excellent. And I thought all my chances now I have red braces on. <laughs> so I, at least I don't have to choose in the morning. So, so you're now up and running. You've oh. got the, the broker services business. You're, you're, you're regularly on, on the media. Um, what from there, you know, from your, in terms of your own investment portfolio, I think you, you've obviously been investing in the stock market and you've also invested in property. What oh. would you say has been your kind of best investment personally, Justin? It's a, it's a corny line to say actually investing in yourself um, because actually that's where most of the positive things have come from. Yeah. Yes, trying things that people say, have a go at property and have a go at this. Mm. But you found you actually, I wasn't that expert in it. What I did find was I actually did understand the investment world and how that was operating and how that could change. And we were based in Glasgow um, as well as London because Glasgow, of course, had its own stock exchange. In those days, mm. there were, what, seven regional stock exchanges. They yeah. should have them still, but anyway. Um, yeah. but, um, and what was interesting there, we actually developed what became AIM. And a group of us there wanted to do a smaller companies market because yeah. what's the purpose of a stock exchange? Not to buy and sell shares, that, that's the second. It's to raise capital in the most cost-efficient and effective manner possible. Yeah. And there wasn't really a smaller company's market doing it properly. 
So AIM was eventually taken over by the Stock Exchange. Unfortunately, it's not what it should be. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, it gave us the opportunity to understand how that should develop and how private investors could get involved with that and privatizations and demutualizations, that world of popular share ownership, which has sadly sort of died away now. Mm. It got people to the idea of understanding more about investing and realised actually this is at least part of the education we can pass on to people to give them a better idea. Okay, and I think uh, you touched there on, on I think what is becoming a bigger and bigger issue now, which is actually that fewer companies are going out to public stock markets, oh. and the choice for the investor is actually diminishing. It is getting diminishing, and you know, the days of actually for people having lots of uh, initial public offerings, so share issues of join in with this and have a punt on these shares, it doesn't really happen very much. Mm -hmm. Now I think that will come back again because there's going to be a restructuring of this over the next few years. But it, what it has meant is people have had to learn other ways of investing mm. through property, through other assets, through funds and things like that. But fundamentally, because they weren't taught about the costs, the charges, what they had to achieve, mm. you know, um, and of course all the rules change about pensions, bless the politicians. Good news is we're all living longer. Bad news is we're all living longer because no one's told you how to afford it. That's what we have to be able to try and do, teach people to do that. Perfect. Well, after the break, I really want to go into this whole topic of financial education. So join us again in a few minutes. Welcome back. Before the break, we learned about Justin Urquhart Stewart's early life right through to the Big Bang. But now I want to touch on a subject that I think is really close to his heart, and that's financial education. Justin, I think one of the biggest challenges that, that we both see is that, that people, even successful people, seem to be almost financially illiterate. Well, I mean, what's been your experience of it, and, and what can we do to improve this? It, it is astonishing, isn't it? And everyone will say, well, it's of course the school children don't understand. Well, of course, no, they don't, because we don't teach it. It's not in the curriculum. OK, people are starting to make an effort towards it, but still, it's tiny. But that's not necessarily the issue. You study that adults running their businesses, you know, boys and girls running their they're perfectly good at running their businesses. You then look at their finances, it's awful. What have you done about your pension? Absolutely. What have you done for your family? What about your parents' position, your grandparents, and of course great-grandparents? Of course, we well, don't do that, I'm making widgets. I can make money at widgets, I know about that. What, what about them? I don't do that. Mm -hmm. And do I go to my accountant? Well, they do the audit, and that's about all they do. A lawyer, and you won't get much out of that. Banks, oh, I don't want to go near the banks. A lot of the IFAs, I'm not too sure I'm necessarily going to go there. Mm -hmm. Stockbrokers, I don't even know what they look like. Um, and so, I'll make widgets instead. Right. And so they just bury their heads in the sand. This is a huge opportunity. The good news is in Britain, we are now setting up more businesses than ever before. We have become yeah. so entrepreneurial, not as we were in my era. era. Um, but now the problem is, it's all real being entrepreneurial. Now teach them actually to make sure they've got their finances right. Mm. You wouldn't set up a business in this country without a proper business plan. So why don't you actually look at your personal finances and have a plan as a corny line. Mm. If you're planning to invest, don't. You know, that's me out of business. Invest in planning. Yeah. Get the plan right and everything else sort of fits into place. Your investments don't have to be hugely exciting and dangerous. Mm. They just have to be pretty run-of-the-mill steady stuff because mm. it's time in the market, not timing the market. Just let it grow over time. But mm. get the plan right first and most people will be there. Yeah, but I mean, I know uh, you have a schedule that makes me look positively slothful, but you, you manage to take time out every few weeks to go and speak to kids right. about this. And, and what, what are the kind of messages you're telling children about financial planning? Just very straightforward stuff. Not so necessarily in terms of this is a stock and a share and this, that and the other, but basically sitting there saying, right, OK, over your period of life, your parents now are living, it's very nice, they're going to be living another 20, 30, how much money are they going to need? Mm. By the way, how much money are you going to need? And one of the things I found is actually some of our clients write software games. And they actually wrote things like Donkey Kong, which I know is a bit old, out of date now. But Donkey Kong, what it did was actually made things relatively simple and straightforward. But apply those software games to financial mm. services. And now you're teaching people about things like this in an, dare I say, entertaining or at least engaging way yeah. Yeah. about things like pensions and things like that and how much they need. Mm. Not so much telling what the answer is, but teaching people what the problem is so at least they can ask an intelligent question to say, now how do I fix this problem? Mm. Rather than necessarily falling into the hands of some greasy salesman saying, here's another product, you need another one of these funds or pensions or something like that. Uh, and you just desperately cross your fingers and hope it's going to work. That's rubbish. We must get people with a level of knowledge and intelligence to make the right decisions. Yeah, indeed. But I think we're not really helped in this by the politicians who, who seem to treat uh, things like pensions as political footballs, you know, and, and they change the rules all the time. And 
every year it seems like there's some kind of new regulation, mm. but there's never anything that says now we're going to insist on a certain level of financial education so you can make more informed decisions. But that's the issue. If people had better understanding to start with, then you wouldn't need to have the regulation to stop the horrors occur stirring in the first place. So it mm. is, if they got the things the wrong way around. But it's better politics that way. You can make more noises about we need more regulation. This, that, no. mm. Teach people an understanding of actually how they can feed themselves. It's the old fishing rod thing, isn't it? Uh, then actually there's a good chance of doing it. Trying to actually then regulate fish as to what you should be doing. No, that's ridiculous. No, totally, so, totally. So, so, I mean, on a practical level, obviously you've got uh, uh, your own daughter now. Have you, what have you taught her about money? And what, what age did you start the process of educating her about money? I've taught her all I know. The result is... Useless. <laughs> Nothing at all. As absolutely. She, she, yes, she understands it. Does she practice what I preach? No, not in the slightest at all. Um, but having said that, yes, she does sort of understand it. Right. And she now loves to understand about living in a budget and those, those sort of things. But in terms of actually really understanding proper financial planning, that's far far too daddle daddy. I'll let somebody else to do that, which is a shame. Hmm. But uh, still, I made a, a desperate effort. I think the, the other side of. Uh, uh, this matter for me is that life is becoming so much more complicated. And most financial planners think we're still living in the 1950s oh. where you've got mum, dad, and 2.4 kids. The reality is now, you know, both are divorced with kids from the first relationship, then they have kids of their own. Oh. And Welcome to the great <laughs> British dysfunctional family. Exactly. You know, it's not, yes, your husband and wife, second hand husband and wife, uh, various selections of children, have the blood test done to check they're yours, and a black Labrador, that might be yours too. Then you've got, of course, your parents, nice to live longer, and hers, and unfortunately, and hers. Grandparents. There are millions of them cluttering up golf courses around the countryside. And then Worthing, great grandparents. We've forgotten about them. Well, they've forgotten where they are. So you've got five generations of people. Mm. Now, if you just coordinated, corralled that in terms of actually just coordinating the finances for them, mm. produce a family balance sheet. You suddenly realize, actually, your family's worth quite a lot. Mm. The assets are there. You avoid the duplication, cut out the costs. And then in terms of the, uh, the amount of debt you've got, well, actually, in terms of the next generation having mortgages and things, the family can actually organise that far better and mm. reduce the cost. If we could start having family offices mm. for the British middle class, mm. we can start controlling what's happening here. And we're not so dependent upon the politicians. And they give us the one word that runs any economy that we need to have, which you'll never get off the politicians. Confidence. Yeah. Confidence so that irrespective of what's going to happen over the elements of politics, Europe and uh, mm. US presidents and things like that, at least my family is going to be okay. But ultimately that comes down to this kind of emotional decision to take personal financial control, doesn't yes. it? And, and my, I think my challenge is, even with successful people, is how do you get to that? For me, it was when uh, my wealth managers lost me £151,000. Yeah. I thought, well, I can't do any worse than that. I mean, have you any suggestions on how we can get people to just take this whole issue a bit more seriously? If we can make it engaging for people, you can't make it entertaining, but make it interesting mm. so that people can sit there and say, if you do this, this happens. Mm. And actually, you can see over a while, actually, you can see how your wealth starts to grow. Mm. And you have an idea. This is the target we've got to get to and you say actually you're on you're okay you're heading that way because mm. most of us don't really think about it too far and you then look back and what's happened the past 30 years i missed out i should have done something if you could just give yourself the targets of actually what the family needs to be able to achieve in terms of those asset values mm. that's going to give the confidence you don't know what's going to happen in the future but actually what you've done is made sure that most of the family is okay mm. and i put that into my family now so that with my sister her children We've made sure so the education costs are covered. The, the, the greater family can pay for that. Mm. Uh, then people will pay back into it as well. The family will start not buying the house, but at least start the mortgage, get mm. that going. Mm. So giving people the starters, but understanding the responsibilities they've got to go with it as well. Mm. That, I think, is the way we can start to try and go about it. Because there's going to be this enormous transfer of wealth between the generations, isn't there? Yeah. And I worry about whether, say, the millennials are ready to be stewards of that family wealth. Absolutely. And it's a one-off issue. Because, yeah. you know, over the next few decades, that got, including me and you, we disappear. Um, and so, actually, we have, we've got to be able to do this over the next few years and make sure the millennials do realise that, actually, yes, they've had, you know, we were the ones who benefited from the property boom. Mm. They've got the property bust. Mm. But, actually, if they can actually take all those issues in terms of those assets coming through to them and manage those properly over the time, they're going to be okay. Okay, well, there's a lot of education and planning still to do. Yep. Um, now, we've talked a little bit about how you, you give back in terms of your, your time with schools, but you're also getting involved in a new initiative called Investors in Community. Mm. Well, what's that all about? This is the whole idea <laughs> whereby companies increasingly have to have 
form of social responsibility. Mm. And increasingly, there's going to be more of that. What are you doing to make sure, as a company, you're giving back? Because I was always taught, in terms of business school things, you've got various groups you have to look after. Yes, that awful word, stakeholders, which are your employees, shareholders, but also your customers you know, and the people mm -hmm. you actually work with, but also society. Mm. If you upset any one of those groups, you know, you'll get heartily kicked. The banks managed to upset all of them, and quite rightly got a hearty kicking. Yeah. So companies are increasingly going to have to start saying, actually, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Now look inside the companies. A lot of those people are doing a lot of good charitable stuff, often off their own back. Yeah. They're putting money in. So why don't companies have a means of, of actually measuring this? Uh -huh. And those that are participating, they earn community credits. Those community credits can be cashed in for cups mm. of coffee and other bits and pieces. Mm. But they can measure how much. They're getting some recognition for what they're doing. Be not the company. Mm -hmm. for what only also they're participating in, but what their employees are doing, are also able to measure it. So they can turn around to their shareholders and say, this is what we're doing. Mm. So it helps companies actually make sure they're behaving the right way and measure it. Yeah. It allows the employees to actually participate, get some recognition for it, and measure it. And on their CV, when you go for your next job, what have you done to try and help? Well, actually, it's here, and I can mm -hmm. translate into those community credits. That's what <coughs> we can try and do. So it's not mm -hmm. patronising, mm -hmm. it's actually allowing people to get recognition and companies to start taking control of this. Okay. <coughs> so I spoke recently at a, an event called Wealth and Society, which is all about philanthropy, and what they said was the big problem was that it's all too fragmented. Mm. We need to try and bring all this energy and effort together mm. to tackle the big issues. Is that one of the things you hope to achieve with investors? Well, yes, because what it could do is allow people then to actually control where they're doing their charitable giving. Mm. It also cut out some of the cost for it as well, because all those charitable giving, suddenly you find 5% disappears. Actually, mm. no, you don't have to get, do the 5%, so you can actually reduce that cost. But actually corral that giving into not just charities, mm. it may be projects. Maybe local projects, sometimes larger ones, that companies themselves want to get involved in, employees want to get involved in. And this allows it to happen and be able to then get some of that recognition for it. If you can do that, reduce the cost and increase the proportion of giving back into it, then I think that will be very helpful. Fantastic. Well, I've got lots more I'd love to talk to you about, but sadly we've run out of time. So Justin Urquhart Stewart, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. So join us again on next week's Money and Me, where we'll find out more insights into someone else's financial life story.